What happens when you put a career-focused woman with two kids trying to balance home and work life in a room with a microphone? Lots of laughter, tears, and great advice. Welcome to Two Kids and a Career. Oh, how the tables have turned. I'm usually the guest on my guest show, but now you're a guest on my podcast. Hi, Dave Glover. This is very weird. <laughs> it is kind of weird, it is, isn't it? Yes. We had your co-host on, Rachel Zimmerman, and we talked a little bit about the DGS. Mm -hmm. I know a little bit about your story, but I wanted to know more. And I have to tell you this funny story first. Okay. So you got into radio probably about the same time as me, like 99? 2000. Okay, 2000. So when I got out of college around, it was 99 I graduated, 2002-ish, uh, one of my friends that I went to college with, she said, I, I started noticing this new show. Um, his name's Dave Glover, and I'm really interested. And he was a lawyer. And, and the whole time, I thought you were Dave Ramsey because she talked about oh, financial yeah, yeah, stuff. Do right. you get that a lot or no? No, but I get it. <laughs> I understand it. Because he was starting to become... And he was on our station. Yes, a big... And I'm like, oh, well, yeah. at that time, I'm like, I don't care about money, which we're going to talk about. That's a big story for you. Yeah. So I thought for the longest time you were Dave Ramsey, but... They tried to make... There was a guy back then named Bill Handel, and he had a, he was a lawyer, and it was called Handel on the Law. Okay. And that's what they tried to make me into, because they didn't know who I was or what I was. Okay. Because I was a client. I was a paying client. Like I was doing lives with Stephen DC and a bunch of guys like that. And then it was suddenly at a show and they're like, well, God, like he's a lawyer and he seems somewhat entertaining. Why don't you just try to be the entertaining lawyer guy? And that's how it started. Okay. And how if it stayed like that, I wouldn't be sitting here now. So do you still consider yourself, do you say was a lawyer or is a lawyer? Because you have the degree, right? Yeah. So uh, you're always a lawyer. But I'm not an attorney because I let my license lapse whoo, 15 years ago because I just I'm never going to be an attorney again. OK, um, I could get it back if I wanted to pay like five grand or something. But no. So you're always an attorney, an attorney, someone who's graduated from law school. Uh, but you're not an attorney. I'm sorry, a lawyer, but you're not an attorney unless you're licensed and you're practicing law. So got it. OK, obviously, we know each other through the radio and we can talk all about radio stories, but that's not why I have you on this podcast. Good. Yay. <laughs> You're a father. You talk about your kids a lot. Nick and Phoebe remind me of their ages. So Nick is 24 and Phoebe is 14. Okay. Our wonderful friend, Mark Close, one day told me, you really got to talk to Dave about his story. You know, Jill, he went from nothing to where he is now. And one of the things that he talks about is his time with Nick when Nick was a baby and Dave was broke and the things that he beat himself up over. I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, you, you just got to talk to him about it. And I started this podcast and being a new mom, I'm like, oh my gosh, I want to know more about that, what that was like for you. And I want to fast forward to where you and Nick are now. So part of it was law school and the debt, right? Yeah. So it's 100% me. My mom and dad were super frugal and saved their money and never laid on a, a payment. Uh, my brother was like that, too. It just missed me. Uh, and so uh, when I graduated from law school, I had student loans and I had a really good job. I was making 45000 in 1990, downtown law firm, but I didn't do a good job. I was I was smart. I did really well in law school. I graduated with honors. Um Passed three bar exams, flew through them, but I was lazy and I was selfish and I was 25 or six and I just wanted to, you know, chase girls and go to happy hour and not pay my bills. And so I didn't. And I ended up with like the lowest credit score you can have and constantly having like utility shut off and uh, ended up like getting garnished for my student loans even when I was first working at Emmis. So through my 20s, it was just terrible. And through most of my 30s, it was just terrible. And I just had nothing. Nobody's fault but mine. I don't blame anyone. It's my fault. And so when Nick came along, unexpectedly, he knows this, uh, and his mom and I got married and uh, pretty quickly realized, oh, we don't really have a lot in common other than Nick, and this isn't going so well, and we got divorced, and he was about two and a half. And it was just hand to mouth, because I had my own law firm, 
Okay. So it wasn't like someone was paying me a salary and I just had to manage it. It was you only eat what you kill. And I was advertising, which is expensive, as you know, mm-hmm. and uh, I just I just wasn't doing it. So in 1999 is my most clear memory. Right before I started the show, Nick would have been four. And he and I have been tight from day one. Okay. I mean, as tight as tight can get. It was me and him against the world. And uh, I didn't have any money to buy him Christmas. It's like a Charles Dickens story. So I had this the alabaster whatever chess set you've always seen you know little chess pieces and someone gave me as a gift and i tried to take it back to zarfus luggage where it didn't come from just to get thirty dollars to buy nick something and the guy was like dude i wish i could help you out but we don't even sell these like he saw right through me and i forget what i did but i did something sketchy you know borrowed from peter to pay paul just to get enough money to get nick christmas and when I started in radio, I started for free. I started paying off a debt. And so about six months later, uh, I had a little cult following. And then in 2004, I went number one for the first time. And they gave me my first sizable contract. A couple years later, this sounds so dickish, but it's just the truth. A couple years later, I was the highest paid person in the building, including my market manager. And it just kind of kept going from there. And so that's like six contracts ago. And so there are about a million ways this could have not happened. And I could just be some level of unsuccessful lawyer. But lightning struck and I got this chance and I did my best and it worked and I got infinitely lucky. And so here I am 19 years later. But one thing that you got to give yourself credit for is that you showed up to work every day knowing that you weren't getting paid. I mean, your debts were getting paid, but that's sure. got to be hard no, in itself. I, I give myself credit for doing it. And when I do public speaking and I talk especially to, to young kids, I will tell them, at some point you're going to get a chance, and if you're lucky, but you still got to do it. You know, just because you get a chance, just because someone says like, oh, why don't you go up and sing or do comedy or do a radio show, you still have to deliver the goods. Yeah. So I give myself credit for that because I worked my ass off. And tried to create something that didn't really exist before. But had I not, I literally walked in to a meeting. I just walked by a, a glass window. And Steve Shannon from Stephen D.C. walked out and said, do you want to do a radio show? Had I been five minutes early or five minutes late, I wouldn't be sitting here. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, it's very crazy. So as far as Nick goes, um, Nick's now 24. He truly is my best friend. Um, Does he know that story? He knows every bit. I've always told Nick everything. So here's my question as maybe from him. Growing up, my parents, they're middle class. They've always been middle class, but I never felt like we didn't get anything. If you compare, and I think I've heard you guys talk about this too on the radio. If you compare another child who has everything then, yeah, if they were in my household, they'd be like, you don't have anything. Yeah. But I never felt unloved. I never felt like we couldn't eat. I never felt like we didn't get to do things. Our vacations were Lake of the Ozarks. Right. Like, Florida was the big vacation for yeah, us. When we got to go to Florida. That was big. But I never felt like my parents weren't there. So that's what I want to know. I know that's got to be so hard for you mm-hmm. not being able to get your son a gift. But did he ever feel that? Has he talked to you about that? Yeah, I don't think so. Same for me growing up. My mom and dad were very middle class, Mm -hmm. but very frugal. But everyone around me was too. And so I I had no idea. I knew that there were poor people and rich people and I was neither. Um, And with when I with Nick, when I was when he was very young, I was really, really struggling, like looking for dollar bills and couch cushions kind of struggling. But he didn't know. Because I made it work somehow. You know, we never missed rent. We never missed a meal. And he was five when the show started. And so he doesn't really remember that much. He just remembers us living together, sleeping in the same bed, being buddies, hanging out all the time. That's, That's his memory. But he appreciates it. Like the other day we watched Iron Giant um, on Father's Day. I made him watch it with me. And he bawled. Because... He was about four when Iron Giant came out. We came out. We started at the Galleria. 
We walked upstairs. There was a $50 Iron Giant toy at KB or whatever it was that he wanted so bad. I had $53 in my name and I bought it for him because I'm like, I'll figure this out. Now, looking back now, he doesn't think, what a foolish decision. What a terrible father. He thinks that's that's you. That's love. That's super sweet. So, no, he doesn't think of it that way. He just, it's sort of like going through the wars together. That just really bonded us. And then he was five when the show started. He was nine when I got successful. Uh, Phoebe came along the next year when he was 10. Phoebe's never known anything, but (laughs) dad's on the radio and we have plenty of stuff. So that's been interesting, is to raise one kid in self-inflicted abject poverty and another in fairly wealthy. I'm in here inside my soul thinking, like when you said you took that $53 and you bought that toy for $50, like that's that's what we do. That's what you do. And it's not what they need or remember. It's the love. And that's yeah. why I was asking if he felt any different when he was growing up as far as you knew you were poor. He didn't. Right. And you hear sometimes kids say, I know what it was like because we had ketchup sandwiches and this and that. And it's just the way we do things for our kids. Has he learned the importance of a dollar? (laughs) (laughs) Not like Phoebe. Okay. I really think this is nature as opposed to nurture because I could not have grown up in a more fiscally conservative house. Phoebe, who's 14, has literally thousands of dollars. Because she has saved every birthday present, every everything. She bristles at things I buy because it's too expensive. She's my kind of girl. I'm kind of like that. (laughs) That's how she is. Nick, the apple didn't fall from the tree. Really? No. Nick is way more like, uh, I have this much money. I think I'm going to spend it on a camera. I think I'm going to get a motorcycle. So, But he's 24. He'll he'll learn, you know, just from life kicking him in the teeth. Yeah. Do you give him advice? Like, don't do this? Yeah. And I made sure uh, that uh, his mom and I, that he came out of college with no debt, no student loan, no nothing. And uh, so he's doing way better than I was, and he's smarter than I was, but he is just not like his sister. His sister's just so very extreme. Okay, boy and girl. Yeah. You got to talk to me about that difference. There's obvious differences between raising a boy and a girl, but I have noticed this. I think about Brian, and if he were to have a boy... He just seems like a girl dad. He mm-hmm. see, when I look at him, I'm like, how would you have a son? And I see how he is with them. And I'm thinking one of the things that I'm excited for, and I think this is just generational. I don't think my dad was overly mm-hmm. emotional and crazy with me and, and my sister. And I think that that's changed. I think yeah. that it's changed with you, with Brian. And that's kind of where I want to go next. How things are with Phoebe. So I think both Jen, Nick's mom, and Maureen, Phoebe's mom, would instantly 100% say that I was super, super involved and way more of a mom than a dad. Like I have you a, change diapers. Yes. I have a lot of female energy <laughs> across the board. I just do. I've never been in a relationship with a woman where they weren't like, could you just shut up? Like, I'm, you're talking a little too much. Um, <laughs> it was night and day with Nick and Phoebe. And I believe... It's like a therapy session now, but I believe I was trying to exercise some of my guilt over Nick by uh, really taking care of Phoebe, and she's going to have everything she wants, and she's a little girl, daddy's a little girl, Mm -hmm. she's a gorgeous girl, and so when a little girl comes out of your wife, who looks exactly like you, uh, it was just love at first sight, and here's a mistake I made, like a marital mistake is that I didn't mean to do this. It wasn't intentional, but I put so much of my love into Phoebe, such a majority of my affection and passion and time and focus and resources into this little golden child. As she was growing up, it was just like we were inseparable. She only wanted to be on my lap, and she called me Dad Do. And we were just it. It It was Phoebe and Daddy. And then, like, I had females in my life who would say, you know, she's going to break up with you. 
you know this is coming. And I'm like, not us. We're mm -mm. And around 12, she started the process. And uh, as everyone in my life can attest, especially Rachel, who you know very well, who I've just cried on her shoulder so much, that it really, really rocked me. Like, not in a fun way. Not like in, oh, yeah, I'm losing my little girl and she's a teenager. Like, I had put all my eggs in this little basket and now she loves dad, but... Eh. But is that an age thing? Because that's what I'm worried oh, about, yeah. too. Oh, yeah, 100%. Is she do that with her mom? They're different. So with her mom, they will fight like cats and dogs and then instantly be like, oh, we should go to the pool. Whereas with me, it's she's nice to me. She's sweet to me sometimes. I make her laugh. But it's very much like, hey, you're dad. You're, you're over there. You're out doing the dad thing and making the money and being the radio guy and you've got Nick. So she's not mean about it. It's just that it would be creepy if a 14-year-old girl's best friend were her dad. And it took me two years to realize that. For two years, I was just butthurt. And I'm a, a fairly selfish I'm going to make you pay the price for me being hurt kind of person. Now, not in an aggressive way, but just in a like, you know, like yeah. I'm so hurt and you're bleh. And it, it really took me, I'm still dealing with it, but it took me a good solid two years to realize like, oh, this is what's supposed to happen. Okay. You brought up Nick though. So, and, and how she says, oh, you have Nick. What if it was a, another girl? Because go with me here for okay. a second. We just talked about how the generations are different with our fathers. And even if you did give her all that love and attention that you did when she was little, we didn't really get that from our fathers. Like you said, she thinks of you as dad. You go and work and you go do that, which is what I would think of my dad. But if there was a little bit of a difference with emotional and physical love, mm -hmm. how does that not carry over a bit? I think it does... A bit, but I think being a 14 year old girl trumps everything. Yeah. Um, just puberty, and I want my own space, and this is my body, and it's changing, and you're a man. And you don't understand. You don't understand. Hormonal, just cool. I'm insane right now. Now I'm happy. Like it's, it's a thing. And so she and I are very close. We're very tight. We don't have problems. It's a matter of it's a matter of expectation and standards. I think for her, she feels like this is great. We're right where we should be. But for a selfish baby like me, I took it took me a long time to let go of, oh, she's not six anymore. Like I would see a 14 year old young woman, but I would also see a six year old who I just wanted to hold. You know, and yeah. and um, so, yeah, I mean, all you can do is just do your job, not screw them up. I don't want to be her problem. I always say that. How do I not set my kids up for failure? And I don't think there's an answer, but we go to therapy and we talk about our parents and I know she's going to go to therapy yep. and talk about us. But I yeah. don't. How do I make it so it's not so. Ah, I think what I, I'll give you the benefit of my experience, whatever you're doing in a good way, just assuming that everyone listening are good parents, whatever you're doing, take it down 30 or 40 percent. Well, how would it give me an example? Just OK, like up until about a year ago, she had already started spending time in her room. That was her little haven. And I would go up about three times a night, and knock on her door. <laughs> Because, and here's the, here's the hilarious part. All the people listening right now, especially the women, are going to crack up. I was worried about her because I thought she missed me. I would be sitting downstairs doing my stuff, and I'm like, I bet she's miserable. And I'd walk upstairs and knock on her little 13-year-old door, and she'd be like, yeah. And I'd open it up and be like, hey, baby, you okay? Uh-huh. Okay. Do you need anything? Nope. Okay. And then I'd walk out, and I'd just be like, oh! Like, I blew that one. Like, that was my chance at in an interaction. Um, 
And it was just ridiculous. Like, I should have left her alone like a cat. Let her come to me. She knows I'm there. She knows I'm solid. Just if she needs me, she'll come to me for a cheeseburger or advice. But I tried to force myself on her and it wasn't good for her or for me. And really, here's here's if, if I say anything smart today, here's what it is. To be a good parent, you have to be stronger than you think you're capable of. Because what I'm going through right now and trying to be solid and strong is so hard. I don't like it. It doesn't make me happy. And I've always been the kind of person that I've always been able to manage things and manipulate things to get what I want out of a person to give me my little candy. Like, mm-hmm. I'm going to put a coin in you and you're going to give me a bubble gum and we're all good. Mm-hmm. It doesn't work with 14-year-old girls. And so I have to relearn everything I knew about getting affection from people and be a lot stronger than I want to be and just be solid and not get my bubble gum and know that maybe someday the bubble gum will start again. And I guess you have to, you can go cry in your room about it later, but just not to her. Yep. And I'm totally tearing up because I'm thinking about all this, like same deal in a a different, sometimes I've think the oldest who will be three in September when she's playing by herself. I'm like, Oh, she wants me, but she needs to play by herself. Yeah. So I need to start that now. Yeah. (laughs) I know. Gosh. It's it's so, it's so hard. It's it's so hard. It's so hard. It's such parenting is the hardest job ever. I say it's the hardest job ever, but it's also the rewards too, though, when she does hug you or when he does watch iron giant with you, that, Get this. This is so embarrassing. So, you know, it's Father's Day. So I got cards and Phoebe gave me a card and she wrote, I love you so much. Happy Father's Day. I obsessed on the word so. I have a picture of it on my friggin phone. If if she'd have just said, I love you, I'd have been like, well, everyone says that. But she said, I love you so much. So... She must really love me. I'm 54 years old. (laughs) I am 54 years old. And I'm taking pictures of cards from a 14-year-old girl and obsessing on the fact that it says, I love you so much. But that's what you do. I mean, as a parent of a teenager, when when they're little, it's like the Garden of Eden. Yeah. You can do no wrong. I know. Everything you do is amazing. And all they want to do is climb on you like a Uh little monkey baby. Yeah. And, and being the parent of a teenager, it's, uh, it's more of a drought. You take what you can get, you know, and you just, and, and then when you get something like a simple Father's Day card that you should go like, oh, thank you, sweetie. That's really nice. You just read it over and over again and you feel stupid and you feel pathetic, but that's what you do because no. you care and you just want it to be something that it isn't anymore. And maybe again, but. You know, you want it right now. Uh, Everybody wants it right now. Yeah. Well, I will say this. I said this in a a past episode. When you talk about your kids growing up, um, I do often think, too, about my relationship with my parents now and how I, I love that side of things as well. So I try to remind myself of that, too. But yeah. I'm not looking forward to the teenage <laughs> No. I, I was I'm in, coming back to you. <laughs> Nick and I Nick and I went down to Florida a few months ago and we're walking on the beach and there's this guy about my age with a girl probably five years old and she's running and playing. And I probably creeped him out because I walk up and I'm like, enjoy this time. It goes so fast. He's like, what the hell? Some <laughs> stranger that looks like Stone Cold Steve Austin just walked up and told me to enjoy my daughter. But it's true. You just want to take people with toddlers and shake the parent and say, you don't get it. You don't get how great this is. Okay, so you're shake me. What do I need to do? Just It sounds so cliche and so stupid, but just be in the moment. Don't worry about third grade and don't look back on when they were one enjoy this like every single day they're going to do something amazing and you're going to have some interaction that they won't remember and you probably won't remember but that builds the wall sometimes i feel like phoebe's forgotten everything 
Like the fact that we don't talk as much as we used to. Oh, she's forgotten all the stuff and all the sweetness. But it's not true. Life is just building a brick wall. And even the very first bricks that are laid, they're there somewhere. Good and bad. Because if you have a bad relationship with your parents, those don't go away. And you end up in therapy being hypnotized and stuff. But for the good stuff, you just have to remember that the tiniest little things, Nick will bring up stuff, Phoebe will bring up stuff like, oh my God, do you remember the time that this? And I don't. But they do. So you've got rough times coming, but it's a ways off. It's like knowing that there's a hurricane coming in two months. Enjoy the beach. Like, you're so far away from it. And now that you know this from someone like me, who you're watching live it, just be prepared for it. Don't let it blindside you. And just know that it's going to be the hardest thing you've ever done. And you just have to be stronger than they are. I read this... um, it was a fake letter from a therapist who works with young girls and said, this is the letter every young girl wants to write. But it was basically, I need this fight. I need this fight with you. I need you to be stronger than you want to be. I need to slam the door in your face. I need to tell you I hate you. I need to think that you're ridiculous and embarrassing. And I need you to be okay with it because I'm becoming a young woman I'm becoming a young person. This is how you go from little kid to grown up and you're going to pay the price and it sucks, but I need it. And it's like, yeah, that's, that's true. That's what it is. And if you're a good parent, it's not like you just take it and you let them run rough shot. But when all you want to do is just squeeze them and hold them, if that's not what they need, you just have to go cry in the corner or do a podcast. Thank you for joining me for today's episode. Make sure you subscribe, rate, and if you're feeling really generous, write me a review. And don't forget to join me next week for a new episode of Two Kids and a Career. 